Welcome everyone. During this lecture we'll introduce the definition of weight, Newton's third law, free body diagrams, static equilibrium, and we'll also examine a static equilibrium application. Let's begin with the definition of weight. Weight is just a measure of the gravitational force with which the Earth pulls upon an object. I'd like to emphasize the connection between weight and force, first of all. So weight is just a unit of force, and it's specifically the force with which the Earth pulls upon an object. Let's consider a person standing on a chair. While this person standing on a chair, the earth is pulling upon this person, and the amount of pull equals the person's weight. Now, let's imagine that the person jumps off of the chair. If the person jumps off of this chair, the earth is still pulling upon this person with a force equal to their weight. But this time, that force will cause the person to accelerate. And we actually know the value of the acceleration because this person can be considered a freely falling body. And therefore, the acceleration will equal 9.8 meters per second squared. Now we can apply Newton's second law to connect the force with which the Earth pulls upon this person, which we're calling weight, as well as the resulting acceleration. Newton stated that the relationship between that force equals m times the acceleration. Now let's customize this equation. We're talking about the force with which the Earth pulls upon an object. And this acceleration is the acceleration that's produced by the Earth's pull. According to our definition, the force with which the Earth pulls upon an object is called weight. And we're going to abbreviate weight with the letter W. But keep in mind that W is just a force. We also noted that the acceleration produced by the Earth is the gravitational acceleration, which we earlier referred to as G. And of course, the value for G equals 9.8 meters per second squared, or 32 feet per second squared in the British system. So if we incorporate these substitutions into Newton's second law, the result is W equals M times G. Now keep in mind that weight is a measure of force whereas mass is a measure of the amount of material that an object is composed of and so because of that they're very much distinct 
They don't represent the same thing even though they are related. In fact, if we were to travel into outer space, our mass would still be the same because we're still composed of the same amount of material. However, our weight would equal approximately zero because we're far from the Earth and therefore the Earth cannot exert a force upon us. Let's now discuss the units for weight. And there's not much to discuss. We already discussed the fact that weight equals force and therefore the units for weight are newtons, just like for force, or pounds. As a reminder, the units for mass are kilograms, or as you recall in the British system, we use the unit of slug. And so you can see even through the units that mass and weight are very much different from one another and it's very important again not to confuse the two. Let's introduce two examples that show the contrast between weight and mass. In the first example, let's find the weight of a dog whose mass equals one slug. So the equation we'll be applying, of course, is the weight equation right here, W equals mg. In this problem, the mass of the dog is given as one slug, so the weight equals one. Now the question is, what is the value for g? Now, a mass of one slug means that we're in the British system, and the value for g in the British system, of course, is right here, 32 feet per second squared. So we're going to use 32. And as a result, the dog's weight is 32, and the unit for weight in the British system is pounds. In the next example, let's find the mass of an object that weighs two newtons. Once again, we'll use the weight formula, which is W equals mg. We'll also note that the weight of the object is given. And even if we didn't see the word weight, we know that two newtons refers to weight because a newton is the unit for force as well as for weight. So two is the weight in this case. We're looking for the mass. The question is, which value of g do we use? Well, newtons, of course, are part of the international system, and the value for g in the international system is 9.8 meters per second squared. So we'll divide both sides by 9.8, and the result is 0.2041 kilograms. We will now introduce Newton's third law. Newton noted that when two objects interact, the force exerted 
by object number one upon object number two will be equal in magnitude and oppositely directed to the force exerted by object number two upon object number one. Let's consider object one to be a hammer. And object number two will be considered to be a nail. And so the hammer is about to strike a nail. Of course, when the hammer strikes the nail, it'll exert a force, and we'll label that force as F12. So F12 refers to the force produced by object number one, which is the hammer, onto object number two, which is the nail. Now it's important to realize that the nail will also strike back at the hammer in an upward direction. So we'll represent that force as F21. Of course, this refers to the force of object 2 upon object number 1. The question is, which of the two forces is larger? And intuitively, you may conclude that F12 is larger than F21 because the hammer has motion and the hammer is heavier than the nail. But that contradicts Newton's third law. Newton's third law states that the force exerted by object number one, which is the hammer, upon object number two will be equal in magnitude and oppositely directed to the force exerted by object number two, which is the nail, upon object number one, which is the hammer. In other words, Newton stated that the magnitudes of these two forces are equal and the directions are opposite it seems like the hammer exerts a greater force because the hammer is able to drive the nail into whatever surface the nail is penetrating but we also have to consider the fact that the nail is able to slow down a very fast moving hammer and bring its velocity to rest and so Newton concluded that the two forces are in fact equal and the forces are independent of the nature of the two objects. So whether it's a hammer and a nail, or a boxer that strikes an opponent, the forces of interaction are always equal in magnitude and oppositely directed. We can state that very concisely as follows. Newton's third law in equation form looks like this. F12 simply equals the negative of F21. We will now introduce a very important topic called free body diagrams. A free body diagram is a graphical representation of all external forces which directly affect 
an object's state of motion. And I'd like to emphasize the words directly affect. In other words, most objects are surrounded by forces. Some of them are internal. Some of them are remote. We do not consider those forces. We only consider the forces that have a direct effect on the object's state of motion. The object's resulting acceleration is also included within the diagram. Now, in most cases, the diagram includes all forces which are in direct contact and we're going to emphasize those words with the object There is an exception to this rule, and the exception is the object's weight. Of course, the Earth is not directly contacting the object, however, it does create the weight of the object, and we do consider the weight within the free body diagram even though there is no direct contact necessarily between the earth and the object. Let's develop these principles by considering the following two examples. In the first example, let's assume that a person is standing on the ground like this. Let's now construct a free body diagram on the person. The first step is to isolate the person from the ground. So we'll only draw the person and exclude the ground. Now the question is, which forces are directly affecting the object's state of motion? In this case, the earth is exerting the weight, and we would represent the weight like this. And of course, if we had to calculate it, we would use the weight equation, which equals mass times gravity. What other forces are affecting the person's state of motion? Because if only the weight was present, the object or the person would accelerate downwards. The, the person would be in free fall. Of course, the ground is affecting the person's state of motion by exerting an upward force on the person's left foot as well as right foot. And so we can represent those two forces as follows. We can call this force F1 and this force F2. And these two forces represent the reaction between the ground and the person's feet. There is no acceleration because the person's state of motion is zero, and therefore an acceleration would not be included in this diagram. Let's take a look at another example. Let's now consider a person pushing a shopping cart. So the shopping cart and the person are moving, and of course the person is applying a force at an angle onto the handle of the shopping cart. The ground is reacting to the shopping cart by exerting a force on the front and rear wheels. 
And also there's the earth that's creating the weight. We have to consider all of those. And not only that, but the shopping cart will accelerate as well. And so the free body diagram of the shopping cart begins by isolating the shopping cart. There's our shopping cart, and now let's represent the forces. So we have this force representing the person. We can call that force F1. We also have forces that the ground exerts on the rear wheels as well as the front wheels. We can call those forces F2 and F3. There's the weight that has to be represented. We can introduce that right here and call that W. And we mentioned that the shopping cart will also accelerate and we have to represent the acceleration using an open vector like this. And that is what the free body diagram would look like. We will now introduce the topic of static equilibrium. Starting with the definition of a static object. An object is considered to be in a state of static equilibrium under one of the following conditions. The object is not moving. Or the object is moving, with constant velocity. Under both of these conditions, object's acceleration must equal zero. And so the acceleration for a static object must always equal zero. Now let's see how this condition affects Newton's second law. Newton's second law states that if we add all the external forces that result will equal mass times acceleration. However, for static objects we just noted that the acceleration equals zero.
So that means we can go back and enter a zero on the right hand side of Newton's second law. The acceleration equals zero, therefore mass times zero equals zero. So Newton's second law for static objects becomes the following. It becomes the sum of the external forces must equal zero. And that develops into two other equations as well. The two equations look like this. For the forces to equal zero, there's a requirement that the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero and the sum of the forces in the y direction must equal zero as well because the forces act independently along those directions. So this equation leads to two other equations, namely, if we add the forces in the x, they should add up to zero, and if we add all the forces along the y direction, they should add up to zero as well. We will now introduce an application that applies the principles of static equilibrium. In this example, a 2 kilogram block is suspended from the ceiling by three cables as shown below. If the block is at rest, draw a free body diagram for the block. Determine the tension in cable number one. Draw a free body diagram for the connector ring. And by the way, the connector ring is right here. It joins together the three cables. And finally, we'll determine the tensions in cables two and three. Let's begin by constructing a free body diagram on this block. By the way, free body diagram will be noted as FBD from now on. And the construction of the FBD begins by isolating the block from the rest of the system. So we'll just draw it in isolation. Here's our block. It has a mass of 2 kilograms. And now we need to represent the forces that are acting upon the block directly. Now, the Earth exerts a force on the block, and that force is called the weight. So let's calculate the weight. The weight can be represented by this arrow. The weight formula is W equals mg, and again, it's important to note that the 2 kilograms is a reference to the mass, not the weight. So the mass is 2, the value for g is always 9.8. If we multiply those two together, the weight equals 19.6 newtons. What else is acting upon this block directly? Well, this tension, T1, is in direct contact with the block. And the question is, what is this tension doing to the block? Is it pushing it down? Is it pulling it up? Well, a cable can only create a tension. It can only pull. It cannot push. And so therefore, this cable is actually pulling the block upwards and counteracting the weight. We'll represent that tension with this arrow. And by the way, tension is a force, but we refer to it as T. It's a tensile force. So rather than calling this F, we'll refer to it as T1. Are there any other forces that directly affect this block? Well, the answer is no. The next question is, do we need to include an acceleration? Well, the answer to that is no as well, because the block is in static equilibrium, and that means there's no acceleration. We are now going to apply the rules of static equilibrium to determine the tension T1. Now, earlier we noted that for static objects, the sum of the forces in the x must equal zero, and if we add up the forces in the y direction, that must produce a zero as well. For our example, there are no 
forces directed along the x-axis, so we're only going to apply the sum of the forces in the y equals zero. So, once again, the sum of the forces in the y must equal zero, and now we must sum the forces. That's what this symbol instructs us to do. This means sum up the forces that are directed along the y direction. Now, how many forces are there along the y-axis? The answer is there are two of them. T1 is aligned with the y-axis and the weight is aligned with the negative y-axis. So there are two forces. We'll represent those two forces like this. T1 will be represented in that sum and the weight will also be represented, but the weight will rep be represented with a negative sign in front of it because downward is considered to be a negative force. So we have T1 minus the weight equaling zero, which leads to T1 minus 19.6 equals zero, and if we just do simple algebra, the tension in that first cable just equals 19.6 newtons. Now you may be wondering why we disregarded T2 and T3 within this free body diagram. And the answer is T2 and T3 are not in direct contact with our block. And so therefore they must be disregarded. Let's move on to part C right now. And by the way, this is the answer to part B. Let's label it as such. In part C, we want to draw a free body diagram on the connector ring. Here's the connector ring, and can you identify the forces that are acting upon it? Well, the connector ring is tying the three cables together, so certainly T1 is acting on the ring, and so is T2 and T3. The weight of the mass is not considered to be in contact with the ring, so we will not include the mass as part of the ring's free body diagram. Only these three tensions have a direct effect on the ring. Now, if the ring had its own weight, we would consider that as well, but it does not. We'll consider the ring as having insignificant weight. So let's construct the free body diagram. Now, whenever an object is being affected by forces that are acting in two dimensions, we begin the free body diagram by drawing the object, so there's the ring, as well as a Cartesian coordinate system. Now, if we consider the ring, we know that the first tension, T1, is creating a downward force on that ring. It's pulling the ring downwards. T2 is attempting to pull the ring into the second quadrant, and T3 is attempting to pull it into the first quadrant. Let's draw three vectors accordingly. So, this vector represents T1, and by the way, we just found the value of T1 equals 19.6 newtons. T2 is directed into the second quadrant, so this will represent T2 for us. And T3 is pulling the ring into the first quadrant. So this vector will represent T3. Now, let's note that the angle for T1 equals 270 degrees. If we start at the positive x-axis and swing an arc in a counterclockwise rotation, that arc will amount to 270 degrees. The question now is, what is the angle that's associated with T3, and what is the angle that's associated with T2? We'll consider those two individually. Let's now isolate T2 in a Cartesian coordinate system. This is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. Here is T2. And from our original diagram, we notice that there's a 54 degree angle between the ceiling and T2. Let's represent that in our figure. So there's the 54 degree angle with respect to a horizontal reference line. And we also need to note from trigonometry 
the alternate interior angle theorem, which tells us that basically if you have a figure in the shape of the letter Z or the letter N, the angles within that shape are equal to one another. If you'll note, we have that shape that I've highlighted in blue represented within our figure. So the point is, if the upper angle within this letter Z equals 54 degrees, the lower angle must also equal 40, 54 degrees as well. So with that, we can mark this angle as a 54 degree angle, but that's not the angle we're interested in. We need to find the angle with respect to positive X, which is this angle right here. What is the value of that angle? Well, let's do that calculation. If we were to swing from the positive x-axis all the way out to the negative x-axis, that angle would amount to 180 degrees. However, we are 54 degrees short of that. And so if we subtract the 54 degrees from the 180 degree angle, that will equal 126 degrees. And that is the angle that we're interested in and let's include that angle into our free body diagram. So the angle related to T2 equals 126 degrees. Let's now consider the angle related to T3. There's our Cartesian coordinate system. T3, of course, is a vector that's headed toward the first quadrant. And we need to determine this angle with respect to positive x. Well, if we go back to the original figure, we'll note that the angle with respect to the ceiling is 30 degrees. Let's bring that angle into our diagram. So there's the 30 degree angle. And do you see the shape of the letter Z within this diagram? Well, that shape is right here. There's the letter Z, and from the alternate interior angle theorem, we know that the angles within that shape are equal to one another. So if this is a 30 degree angle, so is this angle. And so that is the angle that we're looking for. The angle related to T3 equals 30 degrees. And let's note that within our free body diagram. So there is our 30 degree angle. Now in order to determine the magnitudes of these three vectors, we already have the magnitude of T1, but we still have to find the magnitude of T2 and T3. In order to do that, we must first determine the x and y components of each of these vectors. So let's begin that process. The x component of T1 is called T1 sub x, and the y component of T1 is called T1 sub y. How do we calculate those components? Well, from trigonometry, T1x will simply equal T1 times the cosine of the angle. In this case, that equals T1 times the cosine of 270. We know the value of T1 is just 19.6. times the cosine of 270, and if you enter cosine of 270 into your calculator, you'll note that the cosine of 270 equals zero. So the x component of T1 simply equals zero. What does that mean? It means that T1 does not have any push or pull in the x direction. T1 is purely directed along the y-axis, and that's why its x component turned out to equal zero. T1y, on the other hand, can be determined through T1 times the sine of the angle. That's 
19.6, the sine of 270, and if we enter that value into the calculator, the result equals negative 19.6, which means that T1 is entirely committed to pulling the ring along the y-axis. It has no x component whatsoever. All of it is pulling the ring downward along the y-direction. Let's now find the x and y components for the other two vectors as well. So, T2 sub x will just equal T2 times the cosine of the associated angle. That equals T2 times the cosine of 126. Let's just double check that. Yes, T2 has an angle of 126 degrees. That's the angle we'll use. And if we enter the cosine of 126 into our calculators, the result is negative 0 0.5878 times T2. It's very important to include four significant figures so that we get an accurate solution to this problem. And by the way, note that T2x is negative. Why did that happen? It happened because T2 is pulling the ring into the negative direction along the x-axis. It's pulling it along negative x. That's why that component is negative. Now, the y component should become positive because T2 is pulling the ring also along the positive y direction. Let's see if that bears out. So T2y equals T2 times the sine of the angle. That equals T2 times the sine of 126. And that, if we enter it into the calculator, equals 0.809 times T2. That fourth digit is a zero, that's why I didn't include it. Uh, and it did come out to be a positive value. Let's do the same for T3 now. T3x equals T3 times the cosine of the associated angle. In this case, let's take a look. The angle associated with T3 is the 30 degree angle. and that produces a result of 0.866 T3. And finally, T3y equals T3 times the sine of the angle. That's T3 sine of 30, and that produces a result of 0.5 T3. Make sure you take this opportunity to practice using your calculators um, also make sure that your calculator is in degree mode. If you're not getting the same results as you see on the screen, it's probably because you need to enter into degree mode. Now there's a whole lot of information on this board, and what I'd like to do is to organize it within a chart. There's our chart, and now let's label the rows and the columns. This column will be labeled as T1, T2 and T3. And the top row will represent the X component and the Y component for each of the tensions. Now we noted earlier that the X component for T1 was right here, T1X equals 0. By the way, um, I labeled this as X components, but we also calculated the Y components, so let's adjust that heading to X components and Y components. So again, the X component of T1 is 0, and the Y component of T1 equaled negative 19.6. Let's enter those values into our chart. So this is 0, this is negative 19.6. T2x equaled negative 0.5878 T2. Let's enter that. 
and the y component equaled 0.809 T2. Finally, for T3, the x component equals 0.866 times T3, and the y component equaled 0.5 times T3. Now, in the last row, what we're going to enter is the fact that According to the rules of static equilibrium, if we add up all the x components, which is noted as the sum of the forces in the x, these three components must add up to zero. And likewise, if we add the forces in the y direction, they must add up to zero as well. So that'll be the next step that we pursue. Let's start by adding the forces in the x direction. How many forces do we have in the x direction? From the chart, we notice that we have one, two, three forces. And the forces are T1x, T2x, and T3x. According to the laws of static equilibrium, if we add these three together, they must result in zero because the object is not experiencing any acceleration. Let's advance this process now. T1x equals 0. T2x, if you can see from the chart, equals negative 0.5878 T2. We'll enter that now. And finally, T3x just equals 0.866 T3. We've completed the addition of the x components. The right hand side must equal 0. So if we process this problem algebraically, we have negative 0.5878 T2 plus the 0.866 T3 equaling 0. What we'll do now is we'll transfer the T2 term to the other side and change its sign. So that results in 0.866 T3 equals positive 0.5878. And now I'll divide both sides by the 0.866. And that will produce a value of, or a relationship of, T3 equals 0.6788 T2. And this is basically a dead end because we can't solve for either T2 nor can we solve for T3. So we'll put this result in a box and move forward. Now, how do you think we're going to determine these values? Well, the answer is we still need to add the forces in the y direction. That's what we'll do next. So let's split the screen in half. And now we will add the forces in the y direction and note that they must equal 0 as well. How many forces in the y direction are contained in our table? There are three. There's T1y, T2y, and T3y. Let's introduce them into the sum of the forces in the y equation. So we have T1y plus T2y plus T3y must equal zero. From our table, T1y equaled negative 19.6. T2y equals 0.809 T2. And T3y equals 0.5 T3. That must result in a value of 0 after we add these three forces. Here's what we'll do next now. Let's substitute 
the value of T3 on the right hand side into this equation so that we can reduce this so that there's only one variable. So instead of T3, I'll erase the T3 and we'll substitute 0.6788T2 into this equation. So we have negative 19.6 plus 0.809T2 plus 0.5 and again let's imagine removing the T3 and replacing it with the other side of T3 from this equation. So we have 0.5 times the 0.6788 T2 equaling 0. Next we'll multiply these two together and that results in point three three nine four times T2 equaling 0 Next, we'll transfer the 19.6 to the other side and make it positive. And also note that we can add these two like terms. If we add those two together, the result is 1.148 T2 equals a positive 19.6. When we transfer it to the other side, it becomes positive. And if we divide both sides now by the 1.148, we can extract the value of T2 as 17.07. And of course the units for tension are the same as the units for force. Tension is just a form of force that's exerted by a cable. So T2 equals 17.07 Newtons. And now you can see there's not a whole lot of work involved in the calculation of T3. We could just substitute this value in for T2 in this equation, and let's see what that produces. So again, T3 just equals 0 0.6788 times the 17.07, and therefore T3 equals 11.59 Newtons. Now, let's note a couple interesting observations. You'll note that T2 and T3 roughly add up to about 28 or maybe 29 Newtons. However, they're only supporting a 19.6 Newton load. So there's a disconnect between the sum of T2 and T3 versus the load that they're supporting and that's because vectors do not add up the same way as scalars do. And in this case T2 and T3 do not add up to the load that they're supporting because they're not aligned with that load. On the other hand T1 is lined up with the load and you'll notice that the load has a weight of 19.6 and T1 also equals that value and that's because of the alignment. And so these are the values for T2 and T3. I recognize that this was a very tedious process, but it's very important that you study the process and that you become very proficient using the trigonometry and the tables and the analysis that we conducted. And that concludes this lecture.